welcome. I'm Professor Adam Thompson, and in this ECG case, we're going to talk about a 63-year-old male who had chest pain while laying in bed. So let's go ahead and take a look. So here's your presentation. You arrive on scene of a 63-year-old male. Uh, it's got chest pain after uh, working in the yard. He's currently laying in bed. He was working for a few hours and then decided to lay down uh, to see if he would feel better. And he didn't, so he called 911. The only history this guy has is depression. No cardiac history, no hypertension, no diabetes, none of that. Um, so chest pain while working or exerting, and then uh, laid in bed, no relief, called 911. So you start to assess this guy, and you note that he's got diaphoretic skin. He's, he's still warm, uh, but his respirations are fatigued, and he's you know a little tachypneic, around 22 breaths per minute. Blood pressure uh, seems normal, 124 over 90. His heart rate is 74, uh, Glasgow 15, he's compass menace, alert and oriented. Uh, pain is 10 out of 10, and it's sharp and stabbing. When we talk about this pain, uh, a lot of people like to, you know, look for that classic cardiac chest pain. And when they hear something like sharp or stabbing, or they hear that it's worse with deep inspiration or, or worse with palpation, they'll try to rule out cardiac as a cause. And that's not really a safe thing to do, you know, it's, it's not really in the patient's best interest to rule out cardiac, uh, you know, etiology due to a subjective finding that you can't even confirm, you know, different people feel pain differently, so you never uh, should just rule out completely cardiac based on, you know, a, a simple subjective assessment finding, obviously you want to take the full clinical picture uh, in, into a, uh, account, and this diaphoresis and chest pain on exertion should make you put cardiac at the top of your list of differentials for, for quite a while. So of course we get the patient on the monitor and obtain a 12 lead EKG. Now I know this 12 lead has a lot of artifact on it uh, and it's not the cleanest tracing but it's the cleanest tracing that you know I have for this case so that's the one we have to look at. So let's take a look at it and, and let's try to be systematic here. Uh, if you don't want the answer right away go ahead and pause, take a look and, and uh, make your best guess at what's going on and be honest uh, uh, you know do you see anything on the CKG that stands out so real quick let's identify everything so you know lead one is positive and AVR is mostly negative so you know we're, we're thinking our leads are probably on correctly that's kind of the first thing you learn when you learn uh, 12 lead interpretation we have to identify our rhythm and I can see P waves you know however there is a lot of artifacts so it might be difficult for you to identify them and I'll just kind of circle some of these P waves here in lead three and in lead two. All right. Those are the P waves. So, and they're upright in at least leads two and three. Um, and I believe they're also upright over here in AVF. So they're probably sinus P waves. We have a, a normal PR interval. Okay. Now let's uh, look at our QRS complex. There is a P wave. Like I said, there's a normal uh, PR interval. And there's a narrow QRS complex for every P wave. So it looks like it's a sinus rhythm. Uh, at this time. It doesn't look to have any AV blocks. I don't have any drop beats or anything like that. All right, so let's look a little bit further at this 12 lead. Now, uh, we've identified the rhythm. We've uh, simply f uh, identified the axis to make sure that the leads are on correctly. We could go further with the axis and say that lead one is positive and AVF is probably mostly negative. All right, so we may have a little bit of a left axis deviation. All right. Uh, maybe a little bit of uh, a left anterior fascicular block going on, okay? Um, but that's not the, the big thing that should be standing out in this case. All right, so we've got our axis. Now let's move on to uh, morphologies. Let's look at the T waves. Let's look at for ST segment changes, those kind of things. All right, so look at this 12 lead. Now I'm going to kind of enlarge this part of it, and hopefully some things will stand out for you. For instance, those T waves in V2 and V3 are pretty big. They're pretty large T waves. And I know what you might be thinking, hyperkalemia, right? Uh, not these T waves. These T waves are more broad based and it's a chest pain patient with diaphoresis. So it doesn't really fit the hyperkalemia picture, okay? So what other causes of tall T waves do you, you, know, do you have? Um, you should have a differential for tall T waves and you know the top two should be hyperkalemia, and hyperacute. Well, what do I mean by hyperacute? Hyperacute T waves are T waves that occur early with a, in, um, an acute myocardial infarction. And in this case, an anterior wall myocardial infarction. So these T waves are hyperacute. 
they're broad based and they're tall. On top of that, we may have a little bit of J-point depression here in V3, uh, making this a De Winter T-wave presentation. You might, in, you can even look over here in V4. You see a little bit of J-point depression, and all the way down into V5, we do see a little bit of J-point depression. Now, what is this De Winter? I'll write it out for you. This is how it's spelled. De Winter T-waves. Sometimes you hear De Winter's T-waves. Either way. Okay, uh, De Winter's T-waves are uh, just like you see here, broad based, tall, symmetrical T-waves in the anterior leads uh, with J-point depression, typically where you would see a, a normalized ST elevation. Uh, you know, when I say J-point, J-point, ST segment, same thing. All right, so here in V2 and V3, we often have a J-point or an ST segment elevation of about half a millimeter, just normal. It's a normal finding because of this T-wave discordance that you see. Um, but when you see that J-point is depressed in these leads, it should make you think a couple possibilities. One, these DeWinters T-waves. And two, maybe it's a uh, posterior wall infarction. When you have anterior or anteroseptal uh, ST segment depression, you often have posterior ST segment elevation. All right, that's not what's going on here. Here we have an early anterior wall infarct. Uh, and, and these De Winter T waves, the hyperacute T waves, are the only giveaway on this 12 lead EKG. All right, so to review, again, if you see tall T waves on a 12 lead EKG, at the top of your list of differentials is hyperkalemia or hyperacute T waves. And remember, hyperacute means MI, myocardial infarction. So here's a, a quick way to compare and contrast. Now, uh, unfortunately, hyperkalemia presents in so many different ways that these rules, you know, aren't hard, fast, 100% you know, of the time rules. But usually, hyperkalemic T waves, when they're tall and peaked, will be narrow at the base. They're also pretty tall and sharp on top. So if you were to touch the top of that T wave, you might prick your finger, it would bleed a little bit. So narrow based, tall, and sharp on top. So these T waves off to the left are hyperkalemic. Over here, we have hyperacute T waves. And you'll note that these are broader based, they're wide on the bottom, they are still tall. And the top is a little bit more rounded than the, than, you know, I'm going to exaggerate it, more rounded than the hyperkalemic T wave. So broad base, tall, both of these, both hyperacute and hyperkalemic, can be symmetrical. Uh, symmetrical T wave is always pathological. You don't know what the cause is, but you know that it's not a physiologic change. It's a, it's a pathological change. All right. And these, in fact, are, uh, it's hard to see, but they are uh, symmetrical on the, on the right here. If you were to continue this T wave down without that ST segment and then draw a straight line, it would be, you know, almost uh, perfectly symmetrical. Um, and obviously, these hyperkalemic T waves are very symmetrical. I can't draw a straight line, though. <laughs> so uh, uh, they're symmetrical, tall, and the hyperkalemic T waves are narrow on the bottom, hyperacute, more broad based. But don't just stick to those findings, assess your patient. Luckily, every 12 lead ECG comes with a patient. So assess your patient, and do they fit the hyperkalemic clinical picture or the hyperacute MI clinical picture? Again, I want to review De Winter T waves uh, because I kind of went over that very briefly. Um, so in the anterior leads, and just collectively, we call the chest leads sometimes the anterior leads, but we know V3 and V4, specifically the anterior leads, uh, but even the septal leads can, can have this uh, change, and, and even the lateral leads. So just all of the chest leads, really. Uh, so if you're looking at V1, V2, V3, uh, over here on the left, you'll note some changes. All right, V1, it looks like maybe a little bit of SC elevation. That's not the De Winter finding. Now look at V2. V2, this J point may be below this isoelectric line. We like to use the TP segment for the isoelectric line. All right, not to mention that these T waves are symmetrical, tall, and broad base hyperacute T waves, all right? Now look at V3. That J point is definitely below that isoelectric line. And again, the T waves are tall, symmetrical, broad base, rounded on the top, not like hyperkalemic T waves, but more like hyperacute T waves. 
okay? That pattern does continue to V4. However, V4 is a little bit smaller, so it's not as easy to identify. Um, so over here on the left, we have the winter T waves. This is the first EKG, and then this is an ECG on the same patient 10 minutes later. Now you should be able to see obvious ST segment elevation in V1, V2, V3, um, all the way over to V4. Note the size of the QRS complex in V4. This ST segment elevation in V4 is just as significant as this ST segment elevation in V2 and this ST segment elevation in V3 because of the rule of proportionality. That QRS complex is very small, doesn't need as much ST segment elevation for it to be significant. Okay? All right, so that is the change. The winter T waves become ST segment elevation in a very short period of time. So here's the angiogram from that patient uh, that we responded to, and you can see the LED here in the uh, pre-treatment angio is uh, occluded. There should be a lot of vessel continuing on right here, and there's not, so that means there's an occlusion right there that they have to reperfuse, and they did. And here's the post-angio, and you can see nice, good blow, blood flow down this entire uh, left anterior descending artery maintaining a lot of myocardium here. So we had a great patient outcome, once again, uh, due to early recognition, those the winter T waves. And again, I, I did say uh, it will quickly become ST segment elevation, and that's relative. It could be hours, right? What I mean by quickly is it's not going to take years. This person is infarcting, and it's just like Wellens T waves. If you're familiar with the Wellens phenomenon, you know that that patient isn't having an anterior wall infarct, and that's the warning, right, that you're going to have a big STEMI or, you know, a patient that needs immediate PCI uh, and, and uh, reperfusion therapy.